Jim Henderson's Black and Gold Review is sponsored by your Southern Quality Ford dealer, built for tough. And 2017 Nissan Titan. With America's best bumper-to-bumper -bumper limited truck warranty, Nissan Titan. Take on any job. And Slide Hill Memorial Hospital in partnership with Oshner. Here's Keenum. Drop it. Look it. Throwing near sideline. And it's caught by Stefan Diggs. He's going to take it inside the 15. 10. 5. Touchdown on the final play of this game. Are you kidding me? No. <laughs> No, I no one's kidding, were. and <laughs> no one's happy about how that game ended last night in Minnesota. Welcome into the Black and Gold Review Show, our final one of the year alongside The Voice. I know it was hard for you, Jim. Jim Henderson, I'm Juan Kincaid. So it's a finish that has left all of us speechless from that point to now. I truly think you go into a form of shock after that because it is so unexpected, and I think it takes quite some time for the shock to wear off. Really, they were speechless in both locker rooms yeah. for most of the uh, post game. Yeah, it was a crazy finish, not the way we wanted. All right, headlines, time to the headlines. <coughs> Headline number one, hail many. Ten seconds to go. Marcus Williams, do only one thing, just wrap him up. Yeah, and obviously he knows that now. Yeah. He probably knew it then. It's a really inexplicable play by him. I feel so bad for the kid and so bad for the Saints and their fans who invested so much in this. Just incredibly, you know, you're looking at that and you're thinking, well, here's the story of this game. They're going to try to get the ball downfield as deep as they can, get it to the sideline, stop the clock with enough time that they can try to attempt a, a game-winning field goal. It's going to be the Kai Forbath, Will Lutz story. <laughs> and then suddenly, he's taking it 61 yards in for a touchdown. Crazy. Do you realize that was the only touchdown the Vikings have scored this year in the last two minutes of the second half? They had to do it last night. Had to. Yeah, they couldn't do it the week before. No. Just a tough way to lose Because they were game. playing the week before. That's right. Well <laughs> done. See, so you're paying attention. <laughs> All right, headline number two, keep your head up, rookie. Marcus Williams has been fantastic for this team this year. He's going to be great in years to come. Yeah, and I, I, you have to be so proud of the way that he faced the music. I mean, the kid has tears in his eyes. He's been crying. He's taken it all on his shoulders, mm -hmm. stood up, answered all the questions, didn't duck anybody. And they wouldn't be in this position without Marcus Williams. He was exactly what they were after when they drafted him in the second round this year. A right. guy who can uh, be a ball hawk at the final level. Four interceptions in the regular season. One in this one that allowed the Saints to score a touchdown on a short drive that made it 14-7. And he tweeted earlier today basically thanking the fans, thanking his friends, thanking his family for giving him support all season long. The kid knows the mistake he made. He didn't mean to do that, but it's just a tough way to lose a football game. And the one mistake he makes comes at the most important time of the game. But again, he had that interception early on, but he's been fantastic. Tied for the team lead in interceptions with five with Marshawn Lattimore. And I should correct that. I believe that made it 17-14, as I recall. But anyway, it was a big play when the Saints certainly needed it. He's going to be a, a great player back there for a long, long time. This is only going to be a speed bump for him in his career. You're right. Headline number three, a tale of two halves, and Williams was a part of that second half. It was great. Coming back, at Drew Brees, his first quarter passer rating was zero. Yep. His passer rating at the half, 26.6. In the second half, his passer rating was 139. Point six. So we may have had some doubts as to whether this team could rally after such a poor first half, but boy, he didn't, and the team didn't, and they came back once more. And Breeze always talks about, if I can get into a rhythm, this offense will go. The whole Breeze to Thomas thing worked last night. Kamara finally got involved. They were able to run the ball a little bit. Everything they talked about wanting to do in this game, it happened after 30 minutes, but the rhythm started with this team right out of the locker room. Yeah, you know, this has been a team that's made a lot of good second-half adjustments at halftime. It's a, an overplayed cliche, probably, but they have an ability to do that. And uh, oftentimes, they've come out in the third quarter and looked vastly different than they did in the first half. But they've been subject to some slow starts recently, too. And let's get to headline number four, because this game just feels like the worst of the worst in the history of this football team. You think about the pit of misery. All the games this team has struggled to win and lose late. Of course, Minnesota, the half many. 2012, the playoff game against San Francisco on the road. 2010, Marshawn Lattimore goes beast mode in that game in Seattle. 1999 in Cleveland, it's the Browns. 2003 at Jacksonville, the River City Relay. 1978 in Atlanta, Big Ben wide right. We've all agreed that 
that uh, the Hail Mini was the biggest one for this team. San Fran was darn close, Jimmy. Yeah, I've been there for all of them. Juan, uh, the unprecedented. Wait, you're that old? Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. I go back to the leather Can helmet Can we get a chair? <laughs> so that was the worst. It was the most recent. Yeah. It was the worst. That's obviously number one. Number two at San Francisco. Saints came back from a 17-point mm -hmm. deficit, only to lose 36-32 on that 14-yard touchdown, Alex Smith to Vernon Davis. That was a great game, and it was a tough loss. And mm -hmm. I can still see Roman Harper just doing this. Mm -hmm. You know, and at last play, he tried to draw the ball loose. Beast mode 2010, well, I mean, who was stopping him back then? And that Seattle team was really tough at home. Marshawn Lynch, that 67-yard touchdown, nobody could bring him down. It clinched the whole uh, beast mode thing about him, and it clinched a 41-36 win. Another tough loss and a tough place to play. How could he do that? No, don't forget the Cleveland one. I know. I just skipped over it, though, because <laughs> I just want to say that. But let's talk about Cleveland for a second, because nobody in this room was, was even around when that happened. I don't recall that one. Tell us about Cleveland. In 99, well, that was the, the <laughs> Saints' homecoming weekend. The Browns, the new Browns, had not won a game. Mike Ditka on the sideline. The Browns win 21-16 on a Hail Mary from Tim Couch to Kevin Johnson, 58 yards on the final play of the game. And the famous picture that everybody in the newspaper had gotten was Mike Ditka face first on the sideline in agony. And everybody <laughs> thought he'd had a heart attack. Yeah. You know, he had heart problems. And from then on, the Saints would have to carry this defibrillator yeah. with them on the road <laughs> whenever they, they traveled with Mike. But to me, that was one of the lowest points in Saints history. There was no hope for that franchise at that point, but they eventually turned it around. The Browns were 0-7 at that time. In that game, Ricky Williams ran 40 times for 179 yards. And the Saints still lost. Well, you know, but it is the Browns. Mm -hmm. It's 1989, mm -hmm. 2018. Anyway, all right, so how could he do that? John Carney, 2003, River City rate relay. We all remember it like it was yesterday because the Saints did such a good job coming back in that only to mm -hmm. lose it because he misses the extra point. Three laterals made it 20 to 19. Then John Carney, after he was iced by all the, the, the second looks mm -hmm. at it, uh, the replays, missed the extra point wide right. And I remember it so well because oftentimes when you're on the sideline, it's difficult to tell where the ball really yeah. does mm -hmm. go between the uprights. But I just happened to be looking at it at a certain angle. And as soon as he hit it, I'm, yeah. he's missed it. He shanked it, yeah. He's missed it. Right. And here's a good question for you, Wonton. I know it's before your time. Barely. Yeah. Name all the players on the Saints who touched the ball during the River City Relay. All right, I'll give you a help. <laughs> I, I can tell you're stumped. All right. Aaron Brooks was the quarterback, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Throws it to Dante Stallworth. Who lateral, <laughs> who laterals it to Michael Lewis, who laterals to Deuce McAllister, who laterals to Jerome Pathon, who scores. Now here's the real, the real trick part of this question, though. Who snapped the ball for the Saints? You have no idea. I'm Jerry Fontenot, I'm being told. Oh, oh, that's not fair. What? Wait, wait. What is this? It came down from the gods. Ah. Oh. Yes, Jerry Fontenot. Who had that center. amazing block that year on the call? Anyway, sorry. one of my favorite players, Jerry Fontenot. Hey, Great really guy. quickly, 1978 Atlanta, Big Ben wide right. Just real quickly, kind of summed it up for us. I had just come here from Atlanta and watched the Falcons trailing by four on November 12th. Steve Bartkowski, uh, a Hail Mary. Wallace Francis tips it up in the air. They intended to do that. Alvin, J Alfred Jackson takes it in. 57-yard game-winning touchdown. And that helped the Falcons make the playoffs for the first time. All right, that's enough talk about the Falcons. Headline number five. NFC South nemesis. Everyone's talking smack because the Saints lost, but I think the Saints went further than anyone else in the NFC South. Yeah, and I think this is great. You know, bring it on. I like it. I yeah. do like it. Absolutely. Bring it on. We need a little rejuvenation in these rivalries. Maybe the Bucks will even get it together. <laughs> yeah. That's As Tack McKinley, right? Oh, I thought that was you dressed on Halloween <laughs> last week. Anyway, coming up, it wasn't just the final play that saw the Saints come up inches short. See the other small margins that swung yesterday's final minutes in Minnesota's favor as Sean Vazan breaks down the film. And we look ahead to the headlines of the future. How will Drew Brees' free agency play out? And has the passion within Sean Payton been reignited? Stay with us. You're watching the Jim Anderson Black and Gold Review. All right, welcome back in and welcome back from Minnesota, Mr. Mm -hmm. Sean Fazan. Mm -hmm. Fazende Fazan, depending on what side of the bank you're from. He's got tonight's <laughs> film study, and it's interesting. It wasn't just the last play that mattered the most. No, man, I, I'm still in shock. Yeah, it's, 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 it's still speechless. unbelievable. It's been over 24 hours since the Minnesota miracle. Chances are you're still in a daze. I wish I could make you feel better with this film study. 
but I can't. Tonight, we're not only going to break down the last play of the game, though, but the series of plays that, that led up to the play. Take a look. Let's start with the previous offensive drive. Two plays before the Saints go-ahead field goal. They faced a second and six. Drew Brees hit Michael Thomas for five yards. But look again. The Vikings blitzed Kendricks, which forced the quick throw. Had Brees placed the ball just a few inches higher, Thomas would have been able to catch it clean and possibly have enough space to turn the corner and gain the first down, which would have allowed the Saints to kill the clock even more. On the very next play, third and one, keep your eye on number 92, former St. Tom Johnson. Before the snap, it looks like he's in the neutral zone, which would have been a first down if called and forced the Vikings to burn their final timeout and allow the Saints to maintain possession until the end of the game. Then there was the play. In Minnesota, it's called seven heaven. First off, the route concept. Rudolph ran a short out. Jarius Wright ran a deep out, while Stephon Diggs ran a seven route or a corner. This is exactly what the Saints were hoping for, as they were playing cover two protecting the sideline. In other words, the Vikings ran their routes right into the Saints' coverage. The throw was perfect. Despite the coverage, Keenum put the ball exactly where he needed it to be. Then it came down to a split-second decision. Marcus Williams clearly feared getting flagged and perhaps didn't think Diggs would catch it. Thus, he went underneath him, but his dive hurt twofold. Not only did he knock himself out of position, when he rolled forward, he took Ken Crawley out, who may have had a chance to tackle Diggs from behind when he caught it or possibly push him out of bounds. Mm. Mm -hmm. This play will not define Williams' career. He has a bright one ahead of him. His rookie year was outstanding, and it got better, really, as the year went on. Uh, he would have been one of the heroes with this uh, second-half interception. All it took, though, was 10 seconds, just 10 seconds, mm. For those tables to turn you know guys as i've done this job longer and longer i've been able to kind of remain more and more objective i'm from here i grew up a saints fan but when that play happened the saints fan in me came out and i was just like oh my goodness what happened i feel felt so bad yeah. for the hudat nation and for marcus Williams when that happened what was it like in the press box among the new orleans media we all there was so a weird noise as well what what it was one of those couldn't really yeah. gather the words to see what it exactly happened we were all talking about our trips to Philadelphia coming up. I was going to be another cold weather city. And then that happened and that trip got canceled. <laughs> <laughs> Just a hard way to lose a football game. All right, we're bringing you a double dose of headlines now. First headline number one with Sean with us. Breeze all aboard because of two words. I do. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts? Well, he's talked about, he was asked, does he plan on being a Saint next year? And he said, I do. I think you'd have to take him at his word. It would certainly make a lot of sense. The Saints need to pay him uh, the going rate. He's got a lot of business interests burgeoning all the time mm -hmm. in the Southeast and in particular in Louisiana. It'd make a lot of sense for him to stay here. It'd make even more sense for the Saints to make sure that happens. $25 million. That's what it's going to cost at least to, to bring uh, Drew Brees back. He's going to be on one-year deals from here on out. Um, and look, I think it's about this. Drew wants to win another Super Bowl, and the Saints give him that best opportunity. Mm -hmm. That's why I was not surprised in the least to say I do when I asked him about coming back next year. Uh, but Drew knows, um, you know, opportunities are sometimes can be far and few between. So, uh, but in the Saints' case, they're set up for the future here uh, with a lot of young players like that one right there uh, to make another run at the Super Bowl. I think another 7-9 and nine season, he might I have different right. thoughts. Yeah. But he's got to be excited, as all, all Saints fans have to be as well, with the way this team to get, came together, how young it is, how many weapons he now has around him. So I think that's probably a part of this, too. It's a know. nice beginning as we go to headline number two of something special with this football team. Nice mix of youth and experience. They did so much this year despite having double-digit number of players on injured reserve. Well, they picked 11th in the first round. Five of their picks are starters. Uh, we've said this often. There's a great one right there in Alvin Kamara. This is probably going to be the best draft when it's all over in Saints history. And when you combine that with 2016 with Sheldon Rankins, David Onyemata, Michael Thomas, Von Bell, Alvin Kamara, Ryan Ramchek, Marshawn Lattimore, Alex Anzalone, who was injured, um, uh, I'm forgetting, play uh, Marcus Williams, obviously. The foundation has been laid. Throw in Andrus Pete and Tyler Davis in 2015. This is a very young core that's played a lot of football very early in their careers. So. I think it's really set up for something special. Call this the Jeff Ireland impact right here because yeah. he really took over in 2015 and you're starting to see kind of the, 
uh, the fruits of his labor, so to speak. And also, as we get to headline number three, Sean Payton looks like a rejuvenated man. Passionate Payton. We see him dancing in the locker room after the Carolina win. We had the Hit the Sean song and all the people around the community are da dancing to. He has been rejuvenated a little bit because his team has played so well. And he made some very difficult decisions in the offseason. You know, mm -hmm. firing longtime assistants, Joe yep. Vitt, uh, Bill Johnson, um, mm -hmm. the, the special teams coach, McMahon. McMahon. All these guys that couldn't have been easy for Sean Payton to do that. They resurrected the front office. They added Jeff Ireland a while back. That's paid off. And I like this. You know, it's kind of like when your dad lets his hair down, mm -hmm. you know? And he doesn't have to be your dad anymore because he trusts you enough not to take advantage of it. I thought that was great. Yeah, and I think, quite frankly, Sean Payton's confidence grew as he realized how special this team was. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that was there in 2014, 2015, 2016. He looked like a coach that, I don't say didn't believe in his team, but, but deep down knew that team was not good enough and this was finally the year. And let's not... Let's not kid ourselves. Another seven and nine season, maybe it would have been his last year in New mm -hmm. Orleans as well. So, you know, a little bit of relief, a little mm -hmm. bit of passion, a little bit of confidence, and uh, hey, he's a happy man. Yeah, and building towards the future now. Much more to come with Sean Vazan and Jim in just a second. Still to come, though, we look ahead at the other free agent decisions on the horizon for the Saints. Most notably, Kenny Vaccaro, Delvin Bro, and Willie Sneed. We'll talk about it all coming up next. the Jim Anderson Black and Gold Review. All right, welcome back in. We touched on Drew Brees and Sean Payton's futures here in New Orleans, but let's dive a little deeper on this roster that has some key free agents. The notable offensive free agents right now, of course, Brees, Chase Daniel, the backup quarterback, Senio Calamete, who's been so valuable, fullback Zach Line, wide receiver Willie State, who is a restricted free agent. Of those five guys, well, the four guys minus Brees, mm -hmm. right. who's the one player you see as a must-to-have back here? I think you'd like to have Senio Calamete back because of his versatility. He's been a lot along the offensive line. I don't see anybody else in that group. Yeah, and I don't even know if I would call that a must. I mean, mm -hmm. I think he's certainly a player that he's, he's got good versatility and he's got good chemistry within that offensive line. But other than Drew Brees, I mean, that's a... I mean, that, that list is pretty... I mean, kind I of think whatever, Willie Steed you know? comes back on the cheap, though, because he didn't prove anything this year. Willie they Steed? Like him. This nice. is the biggest mystery to me. I, 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 I happen to believe, as we sit here right now, that his days in New Orleans are done. Okay. To be honest with you, um, I, think so. I, I just think you can get a, a slot wide receiver that can do some of the things that he's been able to do. I, I just don't know what happened to him this year. No. Let's, let's move on to defense right now because there are some notable free agents on that list, beginning with Kenny Vaccaro, Raphael Bush, Michael Maudie, and Delvin Bro, who, like Willie Sneed, is a restricted free agent. Of that list, who is a guy that you think will be back here? I'd say Okafor, if he can regain his health. He really made a difference along that defensive line when he was in there applying uh, some pass rush mm -hmm. from the other corner opposite Cam Jordan. So I would say Alex Okafor. I don't think Vaccaro's back. He'll want too much money. He's not worth it. Von Bell's replaced him. Delvin Bro, um, if you could be assured of his health. You know, I, I have switched on Delvin Bro. I think he's back next year because it's very low financial risk for a potential high reward if he can return to the 2015 self uh, after back-to-back -back broken fibulas. Um, it's a pretty low financial investment they'd have to make, and he's a restricted free agent. You mentioned Kenny Vaccaro. It all boils down to what does he want. Um, I, I'm leaning right now towards the side of uh, him not coming back. Alex Okafor is interesting because he's a pass rusher, and in the NFL, other than a quarterback, the hardest thing to find is a quality pass rusher and an abundance of them. So I could see a team paying him. I really could. So that, that, that's something to watch with Alex Okafor. He was great opposite of Cam Jordan when he was in there. Do you see this team making a big splash with one player, one position? You mean going for Going out and buying something, yeah. Yes, I, I do. I, I, I could see it, and uh, I could see it in the tight end position. I really could. Oh, tight end position. All right. Sean, thank you very much. <laughs> Coming up, Alvin Kamara made an impact that no one could have predicted this season. Find out what role he'll have on the 2018 draft as we look ahead to the spring selection process. Stay with us. You're watching the Jim Anderson Black and Gold Review. With the 11th pick in the 2017 NFL Draft, the New Orleans select Marshawn Lattimore. 
If you're not mm. in the playoffs, you're getting ready for next season. Time now to talk NFL draft. The Saints have a number of picks, beginning with that 27th pick overall. The thing is, the longer you're around, the, the farther down you're going to pick. That's the, the bad part. In the first round, 27 overall, they lost the second round pick in the Camara trade. Third and fourth round pick, they have one each. Fifth and sixth round picks, they have two each. One is a sixth round conditional pick. In the seventh round, they have one pick. So a number of picks to do something with. Where do they go with that first pick? Well, I think when you're picking 27th, if they stay there, and without any really glaring needs on this team, I think you, the old hackneyed phrase, you pick the best available athlete, but there's certain, certainly some areas to be addressed, but I'm not sure there's a glaring need. Linebacker, tight end, wide receiver, offensive line, edge rusher, if they don't bring Okafor back. Yeah, uh, edge rusher, nickel corner, slot wide receiver, tight end, as I mentioned last block. The wild card here is, this is a year you don't have pressing needs. Is this the year in the first round they finally go quarterback? I say it's more probable than not that it happens. Remember last year, they almost drafted Patrick Mahomes. That's right. Just saying. But, but, but not at 27. I have to go up to get him. So you're saying Taysom Hill is not the answer? <laughs> He'll be in the competition. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, we have had a wonderful time mm -hmm. this year doing this show with you. We hate that it has to come to an end. Uh, I feel like a Carol Burnett show, um, <laughs> but it's been a lot of fun with Jim and Sean as we do every week, summing up what happened in the game before, the day before, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, it's been great. I want to thank you guys. Certainly John Bennett, our producer, an amazing young man, has done a terrific job. Edwin Good. Good? Good. 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 So good. So good. <laughs> He's good. Uh, our photographer, terrific guy, wonderful to work around, works his butt off, and that's considerable, <laughs> and works really hard, does a great job, Chris Hagan, and of course you two guys, it truly has been a labor of love. I'm going to miss this, I really am. Yeah. It's a fun show, yeah. and uh, this, is, this is my favorite time of the week, it really is, and uh, sad to see it go, but hey, as always next year, right? Always next year. You're right about that. Gentlemen, it's been fun. Thank yeah. you very much. Until next season, for Jim, Sean, and everyone here at Fox 8, I'm Juan Kincaid. Thanks for watching our next newscast. You know it by now, 4.30 in the morning. Have a great night. From Fox 8 Sports, this has been the Jim Henderson Black and Gold Review.